know about you guys, but I'm about had my fill of spring. I about had my fill of pollen. I'm about ready for some summer. I enjoy the summer after, you know, you're not supposed to have to go out on your back porch and clear off nine inches of pollen off the back of your furniture before you can get out and do stuff. I'm still dealing with the fire of God this morning, and I'm really trying to get someplace, but God keeps on having me pause uh, so that we can really understand. You know, if you, you get someplace, but you really don't know how you got there and what the purpose of it is, you really can't enjoy it, can you? And see, I'm trying to get us to Mount Sinai so that I can get us to Mount Zion, so I can get us to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and then take us to Hebrews chapter 12 of what's coming. But I think that uh, it's the enemy's task to hide a lot of times what he's doing in our lives. And I think the one that uh, he tries to hide it from the most is us. Because if you really realized that you'd went free, wouldn't you? I want to go back to Exodus chapter 2 this morning. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. And this is what causes the fire of God to move in our lives and the fire of God to begin to respond to us. And it came to pass in the progress of time, the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and, they, and, they, and their cry came up unto the Lord by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and he had respect for them. You know, as I, as I read this story, it just seems like the old Pharaoh died, and the new Pharaoh came. And all of a sudden, things immediately got bad, and they began to cry out. But that's really not the way it happened. This, this is just a nice way of saying the original Pharaoh that understood and had respect for Joseph because of what he had done. And in fact, Goshen originally was the nicest place in Egypt. Did you know that? When, when the Pharaoh gave that to, to the family of Joseph, that, that, was, that was the well-to-do part of town. That would be like the south side of Springfield, where the really nice houses are. That's what Goshen was. It was the choices of the land that belonged to the Pharaoh. And he said, here, I'm giving it to you and your family. But we find something in Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 through 41. And it says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. That just sounds more like more than just the Pharaoh. You know, unless that Pharaoh lived 300 years, the next one lived a couple hundred years. And then had, had enough Geritol left in him, if you will, that he could come up against Moses and what he was doing. It had to be several generations, didn't it? As well as turning from a small band and to millions when God left them out of Egypt. It was 430 years. Now, I love the synchronicity of God, and it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the same self day that it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from Egypt. And so the day that Joseph said, I want you to come on down. And, and Jacob or Israel came down and brought his sons and brought the whole clan. To that very day, 430 years later, they were walking out. The synchronicity of God. So they came on what would have been a Passover if they would have been celebrating Passover, but they had to wait another 430 years to find out what Passover was about. I love how God does stuff, but when we really, when we read the story of the children of Israel in Egypt, have you ever noticed, if you, if you really read the Bible, it actually causes you to ask questions? It's supposed to. That used to aggravate me. It's like, the, how can, you know, there's a question here, and you get to, and, and it gets you to search, and you've got to search over here, and you're trying to find, you're trying to connect all the dots. It's constructed that way. And if you read the Word of God and never ask questions, you're not really reading the Word of God. You're not being Jewish enough. It's like, why, why, why? God never did really ever respond poorly to why. Never really did he re respond poorly to unbelief, but not why, because why is a desire to know. And so there are several things as I'm reading this that uh, we need to ask. You see, now, now did, 
the next Pharaoh immediately placed the children of Israel into bondage, or was it a progressive move that moved slowly, that slowly moved them into slavery, and by the time they realized it, there was nothing they could do about it? It wasn't just that the next Pharaoh woke up one morning and says, dude, you're all our slaves. There, there was this progression, into, and really that's how bondage begins to work in our lives. It's, it, it, we can even deem it as pleasurable at first. There are a lot of sins that have pleasure on the beginning of it and poison on the end of it. How many people had the, the pleasure of nicotine when they started smoking because it filled a need? Whether it was under stress or a lot of different things. And, and we as Christians, we can't complain at Christians that smoke and they're trying to get that under when we can't pass a donut without wanting it if we're under stress. Come on now. I saw a picture the other day, and it was a big Dunkin' Donuts truck, and there was a cop behind it, and the caption said, I bet you're wondering why I pulled you over. <laughs> we, already <know. laughs> we already know. <coughs> but bondage creeps up slowly, and I'm kind of seeing this on America, that we're progressively being taken somewhere, but nobody's really understanding where we're being taken. I think the thing that concerns me is that when we, we talk about the exceptionalism of America, they're all pointing back to that and saying that was a bad thing. You see, there was a time in America that a family could live well off of one income. Right. Now we can barely make ends meet when both of them are working. Right. And it, they're progressively leading us away from some of the good things. How long did it take before they realized that their workforce became a slave force and the bondage became apparent? How much? Do you know that there, there is servitude in America? How many months out of the year do you have to work just to pay your taxes? You're not a free man until about, what, June something or... April, May, and I'm not talking about tax day. There's another tax day. It's like you work so many months out of the year, and then after that, the money's actually your own. I read this week in, in France that if you have a net worth of $1.3 million, that the taxable income now in France for you is 100%. So if you're wealthy enough, you get to work that whole year for the government. How many know that doesn't really yield productivity? All of a sudden, people are waking up and they're beginning to be in bondage. There was a time in America that there was no such thing as income tax because there's no gain to income. You're trading labor for money. There's no gain. It's a fair trade, one for the other. But it's a way of slowly... And, oh, here's, here's the fun one. They promised us that when they did it, it would never go above 15%. Why are you using tax? Because it's an example of how many things are, are, are promised. You see, it, it, it's one of the things we've got to realize about progressivism. It's, progressivism did not start in America in 1900. It started in Egypt a long, long time ago. And all these promises are made that are unrealistic because when you look at what they're promising, they're promising a utopia. They promised it in Russia. They promised it in China. They promised it in Cambodia. They promised it in Cuba. But it always ends up in tyranny because what you find out, you wake up one day and you're a donkey chasing after a carrot on a stick. And it's amazing to me that the ones that are, that are pushing it the most, they're... Logo is a what? A donkey. And they're dangling on a stick. Well, that doesn't make the elephants any better. Because both sides are wrong right now. Because we have become so accustomed to the bondage. In the church, we've become so accustomed to the bondage. Some of our bondage can, can be in that it restricts our praise and our worship. Some of our bondage is our religious spirits. That we're constantly judging others for the way they look. 
I get judged a lot because I'm a big boy. I do. I've had, I've, I've went on to on planes and I've had people roll their eyes. And I, part of it, I've determined I'm going to do something about last time I went to Canada. I don't know, somebody shortchanged me on the seatbelt. Because normally I don't have a problem. Jack, I really had to suck it in bad. It's like, <laughs> and I looked over and there was a skinny dude rolling his eyes at me. And I'm thinking, don't do that because I used to be you. When I went in the army at 18, they gave me a 28 inch waist for men because that's the smallest they had. And most of the time in basic training, I was going like this, trying to pull them up. When I went through basic training, I stick out my tongue and I was the large world, I was the world's largest zipper. That's how skinny I was. But see, we're constantly looking at the, that's what a religious spirit does. Your hair's too long, your hair's too short. There are some churches I can't preach in because I have the audacity to wear a beard and they're shocked when they find out that Jesus had one. No, Jesus had a Norelco, you know. <laughs> or that it's, you know, part of the Torah for a man to have a beard. We're constantly looking on the outside. And guys, the greatest problems are never on the outside. It's on the inside. It's on the inside. And the Pharaoh within is much harder to detect and much harder to get rid of than the Pharaoh on the outside. You see, God did free the children of Israel when they had that Passover and they walked out of Egypt. How many know the Pharaoh no longer had a hold of them on the outside? but he was still stuck right here on the inside. And God said, you know what? I've got to give you my Torah because you're still thinking like a slave. You're still thinking like an Egyptian. The Pharaoh is still on the inside. In counseling, we call it transactional analysis. Since you, have, you have three sections. You have the parent, the child, and the adult. And, and our, our problem for many of us in working out our marriage is we're still having our mom and dad echo within us all their bondage and we're bringing it into our own marriage and the big thing that you've got to do is work out to the place where you become the adult and say this is the way that I'm going to live and this is what I'm going to do and, and uh, I don't care if you, if you put the toilet paper and it rolls under instead of over I'm not going to have a major catastrophe about it and I'm not going to divorce court because you squeezed the toothpaste in the middle and all of God's people said what? Here's one we've got to ask, and this is one I ask myself all the time. Since they were in Egypt 430 years to the day of entering Egypt, how long were they under bondage and they tolerated it? You see, one of the things that, that I am I'm really, uh, I, I find myself a lot in the Word being a minister, I mean, that's a good thing, but also in personal development and productivity, uh, I kind of, Sometimes just see just how much productivity I can do in the admin area because of with, with the school and everything. But the, the, the conquest for personal development, I think we as Christians, we miss that whole thing and we throw grace on it because personal development gets you to look at your bondages and what's holding me back from achieving. What's, what's holding me back from, guys, what's holding you back from really being happy? Don't say money. I know, I know Ecclesiastes says money answers all things, but it was uttered by a guy in bondage <laughs> who said vanity of vanities, all is vanity, saith the preacher. <coughs> We've had a lot of millionaires commit suicide. Money doesn't solve things. If you're in bondage, all it does is allow you to give the outward image of being somebody and even being spiritual. All of us need to take a hard look in the mirror. And I think this is what God is saying this morning. For God to get us where we need to be, we've got to be free on the inside. If you're afraid to sit and to be quiet and to have everything electronic turned off. This, this is one thing I'm learning. I, I used to with the school. You know, I, I wanted to give good service. So, I mean, I, I had... I have my, my cell phone, I've got two or three computers all set up, and they check mail on different accounts every five minutes because I figured if a student emailed me, I wanted to get them an answer right back. 
That became a taskmaster to me. And now I'm having some of them get mad because I emailed you three hours ago and how come you're not answering because I only check it anymore twice a day? Because it's distracting me. It's distracting me from things I need to do. Do you know how you can tell? If you've got junk going on, turn everything off and be still and know that I am God. And after about five minutes, if your hair is sticking straight up, Jack, you've got problems. Because what we do is we use everything around us to distract us from the bondage. If you can't set five minutes without reaching for that donut. Oh, man. I don't know about you, but I'm beating myself pretty bad this morning. Or that bag of Doritos. And, the, and my, my old saying was, you know, family size, that's a lie. One, it's, it's, the, no matter what size of the bag, it's one serving. The only, the only thing that, the only thing, it, it depends on the stress of the week. One serving, and sometimes it takes two tubs of dip to make that one serving, <laughs> depending upon the side. Come on now. Because we stress out and we medicate. Instead of facing the bondage, we medicate. I wonder how much of that was going on in Egypt before. You see, I even think that probably the, the situation where the Pharaoh began to kill all the children and God had to save Moses, I wonder if that wasn't the, the precipitating factor that began to get them to cry out. Because it was still 80 years before he showed up. But it, and so how, how many hundreds of years did they, where did they have the tyranny of the familiar? We as humans, we adapt to bondage pretty easily. We do. There are people today that are, are so used to being pushed down and, and so used to just having nothing and never being happy that if you take them out of that, they'd freak out. That's why sometimes somebody can win the lottery and you can win $250 million and five years later you're bankrupt. I don't know how that happens. Now, I can think of a lot to spend on. I don't have that much imagination. There's only so many computers. There's only so many cars. There's only so big of a house. And, and when you get my and Mary's age, you look at the house and say, son, you're not going to buy me that big a house because I'm going to have to vacuum that house. I don't want a 14-bedroom house. In fact, Mary and I are kind of looking even with the house that we have and say, I don't know if I really want to retire in this one or not. We need to maybe scale down just a little bit because, you know, the stairs going downstairs and, and, and <coughs> it, it, it's crazy sometimes. But where are we in our walk right now? Are we in our walk that we have learned how to placate the bondage to the place that it's really not a bondage? It's a bondage. We just make it not feel like one. We're, we're very good at, at sequestering it. We're very good at pacifying it and distracting ourselves. And I'm speaking to me just as much as I'm speaking to anybody else. How long have we been under the Pharaoh's thumb and we have dismissed it for something else? How long of that 430 years, I wonder how many of that 140 years, 100, or 430 years there was actually crying out going on by reason of the bondage? Is God so dull a hearing it took him 230 years? Or maybe God in his all-knowingness set it in motion before they actually begin to cry out. It's... I've made bricks my whole life because my father made bricks before me and my father made bricks before him. It was only halfway through my life they started adding the whip to the bricks. But you know, I kind of deserve it because I've not really been producing as many bricks as I used to. How free are we really? You see, if you're free on the inside, there's nothing a man can do to you on the outside to put you in bondage. Uh, was it Rabbi Franken? I'm trying to, uh, uh, Victor Frank, 
Well, Frankel, he was, he was a Jewish psychologist that was in the concentration camps. And he had learned his self-worth in the Lord. They put him in a concentration camp, but he was free on the inside. Not only was he free on the inside, he began adding worth to people around him to the place that his Nazi captors were looking to him for approval. How many of us could say something like that? You see, I, I think what God is wanting to do in this day and this hour is to get us so free, we don't have to have anything external to make us happy. Don't need, I, I, I don't need this. I don't, why? Because then the Pharaoh can't lure me in and saying, I'll make you happy, here's a carrot. I, I am frightened about some of the things in, in the natural that have gone on in our country that they passed massive legislation and never read it. Obamacare was not written, as far from what I understand, was not written by any congressman or senator that is employed by the government. It was written by a think tank called the Apollo Group that are outside the government. So there was a lot of hidden agenda interwoven into what, 3,000 pages or whatever that thing was? War and peace doubled. <laughs> And now the very side that so pressured the nation to put it, push it through said, this thing's a train wreck. Well, thank you very much. And we don't really know what all is in it. But what was held out in front of us? A carrot. Come on, donkey. Come after the carrot. Come after the carrot. What has always worked best in America is that the government would get out of the way and give us the freedom to pursue our dreams. But the Pharaoh says, you can't do that. See, when, when they went to Egypt, there was a blessing there, and they were able to pursue their dreams until they got to be such a big workforce, the Pharaoh understood, I've either got to subdue them or they're going to take over. And see, the church has been oppressed in America for a long time. We, our president, got up and said that this is no longer a Christian nation. He just addressed. He didn't make it that way. He just told us what we were clueless to. And at the same time, we're beginning to see the blessings of God leave this nation. We're having economic powers removing the wealth from this nation. Did you know right now that your dollar in your pocket more resembles a balloon than anything else? And one of these days, they're going to let out the hot air. There's already moves right now to move the world away from the dollar being the world currency to the yen. When you do that, we're going to have stagflation if God doesn't intervene. That's right. Yep. And the Illuminati told one, one, of the, one of the chaplain, Lindsey Williams, he said, you know, we couldn't do what we wanted to do as long as America was walking with God. So what we had to do is we had to remove America from God because God was protecting America. And we slowly went into bondage, we slowly went into bondage, we slowly went into bondage. And I think it's the same way with all of us. The devil doesn't come to you and say, I'm going to absolutely ruin your life. I'm going to make you so miserable that you, you have to anesthetize yourself with something just to get through the day. He comes in little by little by little and it progressively gets darker to the place, place you begin to, begin to cry out. And when you begin to cry out, God's there to hear. We've got to get to the place where we cry out because God won't move unless you cry out. And I really think for the fire of God to begin to move the way that I know he wants to move in America, God's people have got to wake up and cry out. In fact, I was looking at a lot of scriptures. God just had me look at scriptures this morning about awake. Let's go to Isaiah 51 and 9. <clears throat> Isaiah 
<clears throat> now this one's actually calling for God to awake, which I think is interesting. Isaiah 51, 9, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days and the generations of old. Art thou not it that hath cut uh, Rahab and wounded the dragon? I like that, wounded the dragon. Awake, put on your strength. How many know the God who brought Pharaoh down? The God who parted the Red Sea? The God when, when Judah was surrounded by, I don't know how many thousands of Syrians, he sent one angel down and said, take care of it. And they woke up the next morning and all the entire Syrian army was dead. The same God that healed the blinded eyes, that raised the dead, that made the lame to walk, that loved us so much, that died on the cross and rose three days later from the grave. That's the same God that we're supposed to be serving today. But see, when we don't cry out, he don't move. God does nothing in the earth except by the reason of his covenant with his people. The first thing God's got to do is God's got to wake us up so that we begin to cry out and that crying out is God awaken, arise, and do what you did in past generations. This whole book is about what God can do when his people cry out to him and about what happens when God's people go to sleep. Over and over and over again. Now let's go to Isaiah 52, verses 1 through 6. I'm sorry I don't have the preach on, but if I start really preaching hard this morning, I'd probably lose my voice. So you guys are going to have to tolerate me just preaching like this this morning. I want to shout. I'm shouting on the inside. And this is a call for us. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments. O Jerusalem, the holy city, from hence there shall be no more that come into thee uncircumcised and unclean. So what's that a call to? A call to holiness. Shake, thy, uh, shake thyself from the dust, arise, and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught. You have sold yourselves. You have sold yourselves. Once you get saved, you can sell yourself into bondage by what you compromise with. Can't you? Here's the carrot. Carrot. Don't let the world try to give you what only God can give you. The world can't give it to you. It can promise it all day long. It can give you hallucinogenic drugs to make you think that you're getting it. But in the long run, you're not getting it. For you have sold yourself for enough, for you shall, and you shall be redeemed without money. Thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrians oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what, ha what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them will, be, will make, uh, made, make them to house, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name, therefore I shall know in the day that I am he that doeth it, behold, it is I. <coughs> and what God is saying, let me, how many know right now, when you look at the state of the church as a whole in America, and I'm not, not looking at America, unsaved people are going to sin. That should not be, they're going to lie, they're going to cheat, they're going to kill, they're going to steal, they're going to do Whatever. That's a given. Why? Because they don't know any better. That's, that's what comes naturally. But when we look at the church today, it's a shame. As a whole, we, we have bribery going on. We, we have embezzling going on. We, we have all these different scandal after scandal after scandal after scandal. And it's because along the line, somehow or another, we have fallen out of love with Jesus and we have fallen in love with the world. And we keep on trying to be more and more like the world. Well, when you do, you start producing the things of the world. How many know people should be felt loved more at church than anywhere else in the world? Come on now. Because this is the place where 
you're accepted in the beloved. It, it, it's a place where the mercy of God is supposed to be here. Yet in a lot of places, it's, it's just cold. <laughs> and a lot of places, you're judged based upon your bankroll, and what you drove when you came into church, and all these different things. And God is saying, listen, the way that my people were, not the way the Assyrians were living, not the way Egypt was living, but the way my people was living was causing my name to be blasphemed. And right now in America, the name of Jesus is being blasphemed all the time because the fire of God is not in his people. We're in such bondage that God is saying, listen, you're causing my name to be made vain. So for the sake of my name, I'm going to come and I'm going to set you free. And that's really where we are right now. We need God to come and set us free. That's why I've been harping on this for a while. Because we don't really get it. If you, if you can't be free to praise and worship during praise and worship and just really enjoy getting into the presence of God and to lift your hands and to give a shout when you need to and to, to cry when you need to, you're not free. Now, some have learned to put on a show with that, and they, they do that, and they go home in bondage still. But if quiet time scares you to death, where you don't have a distraction going on, you're in bondage. And what's interesting is the, uh, the productivity sciences will tell you that that quiet time is the place that once you get there, creativity can flow. So the very place of blessing to be able to flow scares you to death, and you're distracted never get there. Because, I mean, God called us to be creative. God called us to be productive. God wants us to be a blessing. And you can't be a blessing if you're in bondage. I am trying to get some. I'm going to leave you somewhere good when, when, I, when I get done here. Let's go to Ephesians 5, 14 and 16. I think the Apostle Paul could write this one today. Ephesians 5, 14 through 16. Wherefore he saith, Awake th uh, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See that ye walk circumspectfully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So it's a call for the church to wake up. And if the church needed to wake up in Ephesus, where Paul had spent many years ministering, how would you like to have the Apostle Paul be your pastor and tutor you for years, teaching daily, every day, the Word of God? And yet he writes back to them and says, you guys need to wake up. Why? Because the days are evil. But how do we wake up? Remember a couple of weeks ago when I was teaching on blind Bartimaeus being one of the most powerful men in the New Testament? Because he cried out. Son of David, have mercy on me. I want us to go to Ezekiel 39.25. <clears throat> and you don't get this unless you speak Hebrew. I, I think every Christian ought to have at least a basic working knowledge of Hebrew. I don't care about the Greek. I care about the Hebrew. Even Martin Luther said Hebrew was a pure language and that Greek was a, a stream off of it and he said then Latin was the pits. It was drawn from the pits. Because it's, it's like in English, we throw in a little French, we throw in a little Latin, we throw in a little this. It's, it's a hodgepodge. Hebrew was not a hodgepodge. It was a pure language. It didn't borrow from anybody else. In fact, there are some etymologists that speculate that Hebrew might have been the original language on the planet. The closest thing to Hebrew, which is a subset, is called Sanskrit, and it goes all the way back to Samaria. And so Hebrew may have been the original language. Now listen to this. Therefore saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. God is jealous over his own name. That means I'm not going to let the devil have what belongs to me. 
But the thing that I want to bring out here is mercy. Now in Hebrew, the word mercy is rahim, or raham, R-A-C-H-A-M. Now in Hebrew, there are no vowels. That was added later on. Like if you look at a, a Hebrew Bible today, there's these little dots that are, that, are, that are vowel markings. That was not added to the Middle Ages, and it's called the Masoretic Text. There, the, that's one of the reasons why we speculate how to say the most holy name of God, because we don't really know the vowels that go there. Is it Yahovah, Yahweh, Yahweh? What is it? Well, we, when we get there, we can ask him. We do know that he became flesh, and his name was Yeshua, which means Yahweh has become my salvation. And so when we look at this, what did blind Martimaeus say? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have that rahim in my life. And God takes his mercy, and he flips it around to rahim. That's the word for womb. That what God is doing right now in the body of Christ to those that call upon his name, his mercy becomes a womb to produce a new beginning. It is that concept of the variance between Rahem and Rahem that we get the concept of the new birth. (laughs) God's people in Egypt begin to cry out have mercy on us God deliver us and God took Goshen and his mercy surrounded them and turned it into a womb come on now and when they left Egypt it wasn't until they crossed the Red Sea the parting of the water was the nation of Israel birthed <laughs> that's why the apostle Paul talks about how they were baptized in the Red Sea he was not talking about baptismal regeneration it's the word picture of a nation being birthed by passing through water out of the womb of God's mercy and the water broke and right now what God is doing if we'll just yield to him and cry out God wants to surround you with his mercy. Because what blind Bartimaeus was saying is, I, I, you know, we don't know what caused his blindness. Did he really mess up bad? Was it an accident that caused his blindness? We know that he wasn't born blind. Otherwise, the word would have said that because that was really a miracle. Like the one man, he said he was born blind and Jesus healed him. And they said, we have never seen such a miracle as someone born blind that now they see. That wasn't blind Bartimaeus. Did he get stupid? Was there an accident that caused his blindness? We don't know. But when he was calling out, God, son of David, have mercy on me. Let me enter back into the womb of your mercy so that I can have a new beginning. And that new beginning was sight. God's wanting us to have a new beginning. And the only way God's mercy is going to be released is daily. We've just simply got to cry out, God, wherever I'm not free, I need to get free. Wherever I'm not happy, I need to start. I need, Lord, teach me. And it's not, Lord, don't, don't allow me to be happy. And, and it, it's, it's almost, how I wanted to say this. <clears throat> if we don't do this right, a child raised where there's domestic violence and that becomes the tyranny of the familiar, they get out of that home and they will seek out someone that's going to abuse them. This is like radar. And they'll, they'll have a, a woman that, let's say, that come out of that. The nicest guy that's going to be really, really good to her, she won't be comfortable around him. It's not familiar. Yeah. And the only way she's ever going to be free is she wakes up and says, I am not going to tolerate that anymore. That's not right. And this is now what I'm looking for. Yeah. That's part of what the mercy of God wants to do. That is, God, as we begin to cry out to God for mercy... That mercy is going to transform our perspective about things. I'm no longer going to tolerate this bondage. Because sometimes some bondages 
Can I get real this morning? Some bondages have been very beneficial to you because it allowed you to control everybody around you to get what you wanted. That's where we get the sign that says, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. We can flip that around about daddy sometimes too. How many know there are some dads that are like drill sergeants in the home? Or some of it disallows us to anesthetize the pain. Whether it's from nicotine or from refined carbohydrates. Doesn't matter. doesn't matter or do we live by what Hollywood can produce guys I found myself well there ain't you know how long it's been since Hollywood has done a good movie (laughs) yeah yeah because us guys we like things to blow up you know And so for some of us, it's being able to find peace between the long stretch of when there's a decent movie to go watch. It's one thing of, of going and enjoying a good movie. It's another thing at anesthetizing your misery. Do you know as Nazis begin to, to uh, take over, that entertainment begin to soar in Berlin and other places? Come on. That's why they had the Colosseums in Rome. You go forget about your misery, and there's a guy having a whole lot more problems right now with that lion chasing after him that you got right now. Is there any reason why reality TV is becoming the mainstay of television? I don't want to watch TV for reality. <laughs> that, that, that this was an oxymoron to me. I want to see a superhero or something, you know. Give me outer space. Give me something. Don't give me reality. That, 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 has, that has made the mainstay that we can, we can either see somebody more miserable than us and we feel better about ourselves. We can, you know, or see what people will do for a million dollars. Mary and I have caught glimpses of that and says, you couldn't pay me $21 million for that. That is not worth it. Or five minutes of fame oh, on TV. Well... You just showed the whole world you were a goof and now you're proud of it. All these crazy things we do so that we forget the misery that we're in. How about sitting in the misery long enough that you start crying out? I think that's one of the reasons God said be still unknown. Because when you're still, you're actually confronted with your demons. You're, you're confronted with your bondage. You're confronted with all these things. And then you can finally say, you know what? I think I need some help. I think I need some help. I think every one of us need to write a list down of the bondages. And this, this is not something, don't show your neighbor. Don't bring it to church and stare and say, see my bondages? <laughs> it's something you want to keep under lock and key, keep it encrypted or whatever. But you just need to be honest with yourself. You may have to write it down and burn the thing. I don't know. So nobody else gets a hold of it. <laughs> Because their, their bondage may be blackmail. <laughs> I just got to blackmail everybody around me. Tell, tell me what your bondages are. No, we don't need to do that. But we need to be honest with ourselves and lift them up before God and say, God, these are the things that I need to be free of. Guys, there's a skinny man waiting in here, waiting to be let back out. Healthier. Learn to just pray and to worship instead of reaching for that bag of Doritos when you're stressed. You know what I mean? All of us have different things. But unless we identify them, your faith can't rise to defeat them. You got a target. This is, this is, this is the pharaohs in my life and I need deliverance for And nobody else but God can set me free. No man can. No government can. I've noticed one thing about government. Usually the more involved they become, the worse it gets. That's the tendency of man. That if he does it in himself, it always makes it worse. But when God does it. And so I I, I think what, what God is saying this morning more than anything, identify it 
and then begin to cry out for God's mercy. In your daily walk, not just here, in your daily walk, say, God, I'm crying out for your mercy. And I'm, the promise of God is his mercies are new every millennia, every morning, so that every morning that womb can become greater for God to release something new in me. Because we're getting, God wants to do something. There, there's a new Red Sea that we're going to have to cross. I'm waiting. Everybody, I, I, I'm having people, you know, tell me we're, we're halfway through the tribulation period. I want a refund. No, we're not. No, we're not. And, and, and some of that you know, can be good figuring. You know, do we figure, and this is the question I have, do we figure from when Israel became a nation or do we figure from when they became whole and they never became whole until they got Jerusalem? And so there's, there's a lot of things. All of that we're looking through a glass darkly with. But one thing I do know, there needs to be one grass, last great revival to get in the harvest that's going to come in. And there's going to have to be this great dichotomy of these are the ones that are on fire, really walking with God, and they really show Jesus. Because I think before God can judge the world the way that it needs to be judged, they got to see Jesus perfectly clear and make their choice. I think that's what the last great harvest is about. There has to be a clear choice. And what they're seeing on Christian TV, what they're seeing in so many churches, yeah. is not the Jesus of the Bible. That's right. And so we have got to awaken because his image needs to be rebirthed in us. And it's only going to be produced by the womb of his mercy in our lives to set us free from ourselves and from the Pharaoh within. And so my prayer for you guys this morning is for you guys to be given the grace of God to begin crying out and identifying your bondages. I don't need to identify your bondages. That's none of my business. It's God's business. I, I don't need to know what keeps you up at night. He needs to know. And it needs to be lifted up before him. What brings torment in your life? We need to bring it to him so that we can have peace that passes all understanding in every single area of our lives. Father, I come before you this morning in the holy and the precious name of Jesus. And Father, I ask that we would awaken this morning, that we would see where the enemy has snuck in, that we would identify where we're in bondage, Father. And Father, that you will give us the grace to cry out for your mercy. And Father, I ask that in the days and the weeks to come, that that supernatural womb of the Holy Ghost would encompass us, Father, and create a safe place for us as you deal with Pharaoh, and that there's going to be a new beginning in our life that we can truly shine with the love of Christ and to see the power of God untainted flowing in our lives as we walk out your commandments in the joy and the power of your spirit. Father, nobody can do it but you, and we look to you to do it, Father. And Father, we just cry out for your mercy. Father, we, we ask you, Father, awaken and strengthen your right arm, which is the ministry of Messiah. Jesus' name.